had Ruth had bought me one back in 2006 and uh, it was a uh, it was a Bible with like the different colors like when the Lord would speak Satan would speak and uh, anyway it's I glued it together here a couple weeks ago and <laughs> but it's it's in bad shape but anyway I got this one I had a study Bible but I really I really like David Jeremiah and I really like his this Bible so far so anyway, uh, let's have a quick prayer here. And uh, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to break your word. God, we pray it will find a hiding place in our heart that we might not sin against you. And Father, uh, anoint me for I am nothing in myself. And let this word find a lodging place in our hearts today and encourage us. Amen. Uh, like John said, uh, he called me the other night and we were the other day we were talking and I said John if we were all doing what we were supposed to do this place would have a lot more people in it so I think we're all and what I'm going to talk about today actually hits right what you were saying so I know when the Lord showed me this it was uh, it was what he wanted to say but anyway uh, we'll start off with a with a little joke this little boy, his Sunday school teacher had a lesson on Adam and Eve and how Adam was alone and the Lord put him to sleep and took a rib out and um, made a woman for him, a wife. So about two days later, he was laying on the living room floor holding his side and his mom come in and she said, what's the matter? He said, oh, I got a real bad pain in my side. He said, I think I'm getting a wife. <laughs> so, Anyway, uh, but if I, I had to put a title on this message, it would be Trust and Obey. And uh, what really sparked this the other day, I was reading in the word for today. And I was going to read this at the end, but I'll read it now. And it, it ties exactly what John was saying. It says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Do what God's word says. When you listen or read God's word, but don't apply it to your life, you deceive yourself. How so? Number one, you settle for knowledge rather than experience. The Bible says anyone knows good they ought to do and doesn't do it. It is sin for them. How does that grab you? When you know the truth, but don't act on it, you're not simply making a mistake or exercising poor judgment, you're sinning. The Bible says knowledge without obedience is sin. Amen. Two, compare yourself with others. Paul writes, don't compare yourself with others. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. That's a tongue twister, but that's true. Uh, the guy says when you blow your own horn, it doesn't sound as loud. Uh, that enables you to remain carnal but comfortable. And the older you get, the more seasoned you become at doing it. Over time, you build up a reservoir of responses. And when the truth gets too close for comfort, you have 101 reasons why it applies to everyone except you. Number three. The word moves you briefly, but doesn't change you permanently. There's nothing wrong with responding emotionally to spiritual truth. But if you <clears throat> go merrily on your way without changing your behavior in the slightest, uh, your spiritual uh, boils, spirituality boils down to nothing more than a va vapid emotional experience. Four. You substitute communication for transformation. You talk to talk, but don't walk to walk. You think if you speak eloquently and convincingly about a poem or a scripture, you're covered, off the hook. You're not. James says, do not merely listen to the word, so deceive yourself, do what it says. We're going to look at a couple uh, places in the Bible here this morning where... Uh, 
people not obeying God's word had dire consequences. And, uh, you know, I, I said this the other uh, night in Bible study. Uh, sin. When we sin, it'll cost you more you're willing to pay, keep you longer than you're willing to stay, and take you further than you're willing to go. So remember that about sin. Sin, uh, it says in, uh, uh, I can't think now. Sin is, uh, sin is the wages of uh, death. The gift of God is eternal life. But anyway, we're going we're gonna to look back here in the Old Testament as where Joshua took the Israelites into the Promised Land. And the first big obstacle they faced was Jericho. And it says that Jericho was strategically positioned uh, that they couldn't circumvent it. To get where they crossed the Jordan, it was right there. They, ha they had to get that city first or they was going to fail. Uh, and uh, it said it was Canaan's most fortified city and uh, anyway it says because uh, Joshua uh, a military strategist knew that he should not leave so many enemies behind once Israel had destroyed Jericho the heart of Canaan the enemy's forces would be unable to come together as a coalition against the Israelites. So, so the Lord, you all know the story, the Lord told Joshua, march around the city each day. And then on the seventh day, he had the priests blow the trumpets and they gave a shout and the wall come down. And of course, the only one that was uh, spared was Rahab the prostitute. But, uh, and anyway, Joshua told the people, he said, the city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared because she had, set, she had despised. But keep away from the devoted things so that it will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and irons are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. So that's what God told Joshua and he told the Israelites this. So anyway, in uh, Joshua chapter 7, we have a guy that comes along the scene by the name of Achan. It says in 7 verse 1, But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the doted, devoted things. Achan, son of Camry, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, and near Beth Aven in the east of Bethlehem and told them, go up and spy out the region. So men went up and spied out Ai, and when they returned, they said to Joshua, not all the army will have to go up against Ai. Send two or 3,000 men and take a few people, <clears throat> for only a few people live there. So about 3,000 men <clears throat> went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed 36 of them, chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarry, struck them down on the slopes, and this is the hearts of the people uh, melted in fear because of, and became like water. So, uh, one man caused all this problems. You know, I used to tell, I used to tell my guys, my inmates down there, Sin has a ripple effect. When you do something, it doesn't just affect you. It affects the, everybody around you. And here, 36 men died because of this one man's disobedience to God. And uh, like I said, uh, it's like throwing a stone in the water. When you throw a stone, them ripples go out and out and out. And that's the way sin is. It goes out and out and out from us 
to people close to us and it has an it has an adverse effect uh my my dad was was a hell raiser and he he drank he beat my mom uh he was mean and uh he my older brothers were dean and david and rodney was probably on her all on their way to jail and uh but in 1960 he got saved and he broke that chain in our family and uh you know if he wouldn't have done that i don't know what have happened and out of our family has come probably five or six preachers my two brothers i have a great nephew that's a preacher i have a nephew that's an assembly of god preacher my brother david's son-in-law and uh i have uh eric randy's son he he does a home ministry out in colorado and now uh jordan uh my nephew Andrew's son, he does he does a ministry every Wednesday night. He has a young people's ministry, and it's just exploding down there. So, you know, if you reap what you sow, if you sow seeds of righteousness, then you if you sow seeds of sin, then you know it says in the Bible that sin goes to the third and fourth generation. You know, and. Uh, but anyway, thank God my dad broke that chain. And not, not only did he get saved, but it wasn't too long my Uncle Harry came here and got, you know, came to Parsonville and got saved. So anyway, uh, but anyway, and then it says in verse, uh, verse 6, John 16, 16, verse 6, Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord remaining till evening and the elders of israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads and joshua said alas lord why did you ever bring me across the jordan to deliver me into the hands of the amorites and destroy us if only we had been content to stay on the other side of the jordan pardon your servant lord what can i say now that israel has been routed by its enemies the Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this and they will surround us and wipe our name out from the earth. When will you do for your own, what will you do for your own great name? The Lord said to Joshua, stand up. You are doing, what, what are you doing down in your face? Israel has sinned and they have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things and they have stolen, they have lied, and they have put them in their own possessions. That is what, why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have made liable destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. So that one man caused God's covering to leave the Israelites. And... Uh, you know, uh, anyway, let's go on here. Go concentrate the people and tell them yourselves in preparation tomorrow. For this is what the Lord God of Israel says. There are devoted things among you. Israel cannot stand against your enemies until you remove them. So I'm not going to read a lot of this. But anyway, Joshua had all the tribes come before him the next morning. And anyway, uh, he said he had uh, it says Joshua had his family come forward man by man and Achan the son of Camry the son of Zimri the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah was chosen then Joshua said to Achan my son give glory to the Lord the God of Israel and honor him tell me what you have done to and do not hide it from me Achan replied it is true I have sinned against the Lord the God of Israel this is what I have done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful Babylonian robe, 200 shekels of silver, and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. And, uh, but anyway, uh, Boy, this print's so small, it's hard to see up here. I should have got the large print. And uh, it says that 
out of the out before the Lord and completely the Israelites spread them out before the Lord and completely so that the pivotal point in Israel's history the people would understand uh, the necessity completely of complete obedience there is no victory where sin is present so let's see what happens here so Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent there it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath they took the things from the tent brought them to Joshua and the Israelites and spread them out before the Lord then Joshua with all the Israelites took Achan son of Zerah the silver the robe the gold his sons his daughters his cattle his donkeys his sheep his tent and all he had to the valley of Achor Joshua said you have brought this trouble on us the Lord will bring trouble on you today then all Israel stoned him and after they had stoned him the rest they burned him over Achan they heaped a large pile of rocks where it remains to this day then the Lord turned his fierce anger Therefore, this place was called the Valley of Achor ever since. So when I said before how your sin affects not only you, his whole family. And you, you might think that's a little, a little much. Uh, but the Lord put out a distinct command that they what they were to do and Achan he he cost 36 men their lives by dis by being disobedience so then we're going to go over here to uh, verse 15 we're going to go over to first Samuel here uh, chapter 15 and this is uh, when the Lord, when Israel wanted a king. And Saul, or uh, Samuel, Lord said, you know, give them, give them a king. Give them what they want. So in verse 15, Samuel said to Saul, I am the, uh, the Lord. I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over the people of Israel. And to listen to how the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty said. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go and attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men, women, children, infants, cattle, sheep, camels, and donkeys. So it says Samuel, Saul summoned the men and mustered them at Telem, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 from Judah. Saul went up to the city of Amalek, set the ambush in the ravine, then said to the Canaanites, go away from the Amalekites so I do not destroy you along with them. For you showed kindness to all the Israelites when they came out from Egypt. The Canaanites moved away from the Amalekites. It said against us, anyway, we'll get back to that. It says then in verse 7, Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur, near the eastern border of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and his army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and the lambs, and everything that was good they were unwilling to destroy completely but everything that was despised and weakened he totally destroyed so it says uh, against Samuel's instruction Saul spared Agag and the best of the livestock and then kept the choice animals for himself uh, the selfishness and outright outright rebellion against God's laws and disgraced the holiness the holiness caused God to regret making Saul king so uh, 
Anyway, Saul did not follow his instructions. Samuel gave him the distinct instructions, destroy everything. So then, the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instruction. Samuel was angry and cried out to the Lord all night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument of his honor and has turned and gone down to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, The Lord bless you, I have carried out the Lord's instructions. So, uh, it says, Saul claimed he had carried out the Lord's instructions, but Samuel confronted him. Then twice he blamed the soldiers for his disobedience. If he had acknowledged his sin immediately, perhaps his punishment would not have been so severe. So, typical politician. Let's play, play the blame game, you know. So he's, he's blaming, blaming his soldiers, first of all. And uh, lie and deny. That's what Samuel. But it says if, Sam, if Saul would have maybe been up front with Samuel and said, Samuel, I messed up. Forgive me, I ask the Lord to forgive me. Maybe he would have got a hall pass. But uh, anyway, let's see what happens here. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, The Lord bless you, I've carried out the Lord's instruction. But Samuel said, What is this? I, I, what is this? Bleeding a sheep in my ears? What is this? The lowing of cattle I hear? Saul answered, The soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and the cattle to sacrifice to the Lord, your God, but we totally destroyed the rest. Enough, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, Saul said. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become uh, the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission saying, Go completely destroy the wicked people of Am Amalekites. Wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? So Samuel put it right straight to him. You know, uh, he, he's saying he did, you know, he did his job, but he didn't. And... Uh, it says, why did you not obey the Lord? Why, didn't, why did you pounce on the plunder and, and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on a mission and the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back King Agag, their king. The soldiers took the sheep and the cattle and the plunder and the best of what was devoted to God in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gil Gilgal. Samuel replied, does the Lord de delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. So, he lied again. He, he says, well, he, first of all, he said the, sol the soldiers wanted it. And now, now he's telling Samuel, well, I brought it so we could sacrifice it. And if you remember, I read, he, he took the stuff for himself. Yeah. Then he set a monument up at Gilgal to, for all the people to cheer on him. Pride. Pride. And, and, the, and, the, and the pride of life and the lust of the eye. He saw that cattle and stuff and he wanted it, you know. And Samuel warned the people of Israel. He said, the king will take your best young men and put them in the service. And, Sam, and Saul did. When he saw somebody that was really maybe like a well-built young man, he said, you're coming with me. You're going to serve in the army. Because Saul was a warrior. He, he, it says the whole time he was in as king, he fought continually with the Philistines. That was 
He he was in constant battle. He was, and you know he he was he was he was quite a man too. It said he stood a head taller than all the other people. You know he was a big man. He was good looking. You know, and uh, but when Samuel anointed him as king, evidently it went to right to here, and uh, you know I I saw that down the boot camp. I saw guys they'd make. You know, they'd make officers and stuff, and uh, it went right to their head. They were just so arrogant, and, uh, you know, we, we used to have to salute the commissioned officers, you know, and I, I'd salute, a lot of them, I'd salute the position, but not the man, you know. And when I first started down there, the, John Wirtz was the commander, and he told me something I'll never forget. He said, respect can't be demanded or commanded. It has to be earned. So, you know, uh, Saul, Saul was being big in his own eyes here. But anyway, but Samuel said, I will not, <clears throat> then Saul said to Samuel, uh, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's commands and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. And uh, it said, even if Saul's intentions had been pure, he still disobeyed God's uh, God's decree. Partial obedience is just another form of disobedience. So, you know, what, what does God say being about lukewarm? I'll spew you out of my mouth. Right there. You know, he, 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 wasn't, fully, he, he wasn't fully disobedient, but he was partial disobedient, and that was just as bad as being di completely disobedient. So then it, it said Samuel turned to leave. Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe and it tore. Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one who is better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not change his mind for he is not a human being that should change his mind. So Saul or Samuel's telling Saul, this is, this is settled. You lied to me, you deceived me, you deceived the Lord. Now you're done. And uh, But Saul, Saul replied, I have sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel went back with Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. Then Samuel said, Bring me Agag, king of the Amalekites. Agag came to him in chains, and he thought, Surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so will your mother be childless among women. And Samuel put Agag to death before the Lord at Gilgal. And that's what Saul should have did. when he. So Samuel finished the job. Then Samuel left for Ramah, but Saul went up to his home at Gibeah of Saul. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. So there's two examples today of uh, how disobedience and not obeying God had drastic, drastic consequences. For, for these guys and uh, of course we we know as it went on how uh, Saul pressed David into his service and tried to kill him and uh, you know how how his David went and raised his hands against the, the Lord's anointed but it said David was 16 when after this Samuel went and anointed David king David was 16 when he became anointed king, and he was 30 years old before he got the throne. So he, he ran and hid from Saul 
and avoided him for 14 years before he became king. But David would not had, I was just reading in there this morning where he had two opportunities to kill Saul and he wouldn't do it. He said no, he would not raise his hands against the Lord's anointed. And of course you know how the story ends, Saul and his sons fell to the Philistines. And uh, But anyway, uh, you think, well the Lord was the Lord was pretty, pretty severe in the punishments of these two guys, but uh, you know, uh, they were they were under the law then; they weren't under grace, and uh, God had to set examples uh, for these people to uh, be brought up, especially Saul being the first king that was anointed over Israel and what he did. And, uh, but like, like it said, if he would have just been maybe real upfront with Samuel and said, hey, yeah, I, I did wrong. But he, he tried to lie and deny. He tried to pass the buck. And the buck, Samuel says, no, the buck stops here, buddy. You're, you're the guy that sinned. You're the guy that did wrong. And uh, anyway, so <clears throat> Rich, come on up, and we'll uh, we'll give we'll give Pastor.